Hi guys, this is Mrs. Foy and we're going to talk today about the um, neural control of breathing in humans and also the transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So um, this shouldn't take us too long but this is a this is a very important topic. So um, breathing in humans is under autonomic control and voluntary control. Okay, so you can, up to a point, control your breathing, um, and then, of course, most of the time, your breathing is on autopilot. So um, the two parts of the brain that are going to control um, the respiration on the autonomic side um, are going to be the uh, medulla oblongata, or sometimes just called the medulla, and the pons. Um, both of those structures in the brain, remember, are in are, are considered to be the brain stem. And remember that the further down um, the brain you go toward the spinal cord, the more rudimentary functions, um, you know, kind of essential functions, uh, physiological functions that um, that occur there. So um, the pons regulates the, the tempo of breathing and the medulla um, is going to regulate the, the rate and the depth of our breathing and it's going to respond especially to pH changes. So we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, there are sensors in the carotid and the aortic arteries that are going to monitor carbon dioxide and oxygen levels in the blood. And you may think that the oxygen level, you may think that it is the lower oxygen level that would trigger breathing to occur faster, but actually it is a higher CO2 level. So remember that the CO2 sensors, these uh, carotid bodies that are here in the carotid arteries, and there's also one that's also in the, um, the aortic loop, um, these are chemosensors that are going to respond to changes in pH. And so um, one of the things that you know is that carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid, but that is going to lower the pH. And so these uh, chemoreceptors here are sensitive to pH changes in the blood which would correlate with a higher CO2 level in the blood, which would correlate with um, the cells in the body um, not getting the oxygen and get, getting rid of the CO2 that they need. And so that would increase the signal for increasing the rate and the depth of breathing. And so these um, signals from the medulla, there's a respiratory or a mnemonic control center in the medulla, um, and also in the pons, but this one, uh, the chemoreceptors, um, we think go straight to the medulla. That's going to um, stimulate the diaphragm to contract and initiate breathing and, and a faster pace and bigger, deeper breaths. And also remember the accessory muscles like intercostal muscles are going to help flare out the rib cage and get the, the, the depth of the breathing, more, more air filling the lungs. So, um, in order to be able to meet the, de the metabolic demands of organisms, um, we're going to need to transport large amounts of oxygen and CO2. And so two of the, the gases that we are going to be uh, obviously uh, interested in are oxygen and CO2. And we talk about the partial pressure of CO2 and the partial pressure of oxygen. That's how we measure the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide um, in uh, three places, the um, alveoli, the cells, and in the blood. So um, if you take a look at what's happening in the alveolus, and these would be the capillaries that are surrounding the alveolus in the um, in the lungs, you can see that the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli would be about 100 millimeters of mercury. And the blood that is coming uh, in the capillaries across those, out, those air sacs, those alveoli, the partial pressure of oxygen is only 40. So you can see that oxygen is going to diffuse down its concentration gradient from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. 
and the oxygen is going to be um, diffusing into the blood. So the partial pressure of oxygen then, then that is delivered to the cells, so now we're in the body tissue in the cells, the partial pressure of oxygen in the cells is about 40 millimeters of mercury, and so oxygen is going to diffuse into the cells from a higher pressure um, in the capillaries coming to the body tissues and it's going to diffuse into the body cells. Notice, interestingly, that not all the oxygen diffuses into the cells. So it's not like you get like zero um, partial pressure of oxygen. So some of the oxygen is still left in the cells, uh, excuse me, still left in the circulatory system, but still it's at a lower partial pressure so oxygen can still diffuse in. So what happens with CO2 is, is just the opposite, but not quite as much of a, of a differential. So uh, the partial pressure of CO2 in the body cells, of course, this is where carbon dioxide is produced, right? It's going to be the waste product, waste product with cellular respiration, is about 46 millimeters of mercury. And the uh, partial pressure of CO2 um, in the capillaries coming to the cells is about 40. So you see there's not that much of a delta between the partial pressure in the cells and the partial pressure in the capillary, but enough so that the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse in. And the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in the alveolus is 40 millimeters of mercury, and so carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from the blood to the alveoli, and that is then exhaled. So, um, Oxygen um, is not very um, uh, soluble in uh, water, and blood is mostly water. So oxygen, not very much of oxygen, very, very little of it actually diffuses into the blood itself. It has to be carried, and that is the job of the respiratory pigments, which are proteins. So um, we know that our respiratory pigment is hemoglobin, and we've certainly talked about hemoglobin before, and we have talked about the importance of the hemoglobin protein and how that gets deformed um, with, with sickle cell. But not all animals have hemoglobin as a respiratory protein. Um, arthropods and a lot of mollusks use hemocyanin, which has copper as its oxygen binding component, and um, this gives the blood of these animals kind of a bluish tint, and um, our mineral, or our metal, I should say, that's in the hemoglobin um, is iron, and that's what gives our um, blood a reddish tint. So here is a, a, a cartoon of a hemoglobin chain. You can see that it has four subunits and four heme um, groups, and this heme is the iron, and that's going to be where the oxygen is going to bind. So each hemoglobin molecule has the capacity of binding four oxygen molecules. So um, that's important. So the idea, though, is that you don't really want the hemoglobin to grab onto the oxygen tightly, right? Because the whole idea is that you want the hemoglobin to grab the oxygen, but then you want it to be able to let go of it when it gets to the cells, right? Because if the hemoglobin would grab tightly to the oxygen, it would not be um, delivered, it would not be able to let go and have it delivered to the cells when it gets there. So we use this word called affinity to describe the hold that the hemoglobin has on the oxygen. If there is a high affinity, that means the hemoglobin is really going to grab onto the oxygen. If it has a low affinity, that means it's not holding onto the oxygen very tightly and the oxygen is then more easily um, delivered to the cells. So um, I'm going to talk about something called the Bohr shift in just for a second, but let's just talk about a normal, this is called a hemoglobin dissociation curve. I would highly, highly suggest that you understand this because this is typically um, going to be on all AP Biology exams. So let's take a look at what this is showing us. So here we're looking at the partial pressure of oxygens in the lung. So we got 100% partial pressure here in the lungs and the partial pressure of tissues at rest and the partial pressure of tissues during exercise. And you can see that during exercise, the oxygen partial pressure is way low, right? Makes sense because obviously 
um, you're using it to uh, in those mitochondria to produce a lot more ATPs. So if you look at the uh, the saturation of the hemoglobin, okay, at rest. So look at the delta here. So here is where we have the 100% um, saturation um, in the with the partial pressures in the lungs. The amount of oxygen that's unloaded to the tissues at rest is this amount. Okay, so that means the hemoglobin is going to let go of that much um, uh, oxygen, right? So it's it only is about 75% saturated. But look what happens um, to the saturation of the hemoglobin during exercise. It's way down here, right? That means it's not very saturated. That's good because if the oxygen um, was satur if the hemoglobin was saturated with oxygen, it would not be delivering the oxygen to the tissues. So look how much oxygen can be delivered to the tissues during exercise versus how much oxygen can be delivered to the tissues at rest. So that's a very important understanding of the dissociation curve of hemoglobin. But very interestingly, what happens during um, exercise um, also is the increase of carbon dioxide, okay? So remember that carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid, but it is an acid. And so what happens is, is when you have high CO2 concentration, the pH in the blood is going to shift from about 7.4 to 7.2. And what happens is, is that you can see even at the same partial pressure of oxygen, um, and this could be like in the tissues at rest, there is a decrease in the saturation of the hemoglobin at a lower, more acidic pH. And that is called the Bohr shift. So you can see here this shift from a normal pH to a lower pH, which is associated with a higher carbon dioxide concentration, is going to result in less saturated hemoglobin and therefore more oxygen delivered to the tissues. Because, okay, after all, if you have a higher CO2 level, then that is a signal that your cells need more oxygen. If they need more oxygen, you want the hemoglobin to not hold onto the oxygen and let it go, be less saturated so it's going to be picked up. Okay? So I want to talk just a little bit about how carbon dioxide is transported. And carbon dioxide is transported in three ways. Um, carbon dioxide, about 23% of carbon dioxide, and I've, I'll blow this up a little bit bigger in just a second, but about 23% of uh, carbon dioxide is actually bound to the hemoglobin um, molecule itself. About 7% is just... Uh, dissolved in the plasma itself because it, it can react with water and just dissolve. And about 70% of it is actually um, reacts with water in the red blood cells to form carbonic acid and that is an important buffer um, in the body. Okay, so here we have carbon dioxide. Remember, it doesn't diffuse directly into the capillary, right? It's going to go into the interstitial fluid first and then from the interstitial fluid across the capillary wall into the red blood cells, which are going to be traveling down that capillary tube. And so um, we see that about 70% um, um, is going to be converted to carbonic acid. Some of the CO2 is actually picked up by the hemoglobin itself, and then it is transported to the lungs. When the red blood cell gets to the lungs, the carbon dioxide is released from the hemoglobin, um, and um, is also there is a shift so that the uh, carbonic acid is uh, dissociates into the water and the carbon dioxide, and this carbon dioxide then diffuses uh, across the capillary in the lungs um, and through the interstitial fluid into the alveoli and it is exhaled. So um, this is actually a question on your study guide and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. So this question is talking about the, um, the dissociation curve in a fetus. 
So um, the question is saying that if C is the normal oxygen dissociation curve in a normal adult, okay, so C is going to be a normal adult, which one of those curves would be the fetal hemoglobin curve? So one of the things I want you to think about is that um, when you have maternal hemoglobin bringing oxygen to the fetus, okay, do you think the fetal, hemo the fetal hemoglobin is going to have a higher affinity of oxygen than the maternal hemoglobin or a lower? So think about what it would need to be able to grab the oxygen from the maternal hemoglobin, okay? So if you can answer that question, then you should be able to predict which of these curves, and I'll give you a hint, it's either B or D, um, is going to be the fetal hemoglobin dissociation curve if you reason what the fetal hemoglobin would need compared to the maternal hemoglobin. Okay, so think about what the fetal hemoglobin would need. Would it need a higher affinity for the oxygen to be able to grab it from the maternal hemoglobin or not? So um, if you have so many questions with that, see me in class. And you guys have a nice evening or afternoon or day, whatever you're, whenever time you're watching this.